RF photonics filter with record low noise and 160, 16 uh, dB dynamic range uh, to be given by uh, Professor Ben uh, Eagleton and uh, Dr. Uh, David Maapung at uh, uh, University of Sydney. And uh, we can see already your face and Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, he actually, as you know, uh, I don't have to uh, explain uh, who he is, but uh, he, uh, as, as uh, he, uh, you know, uh, act as uh, many directors, like uh, laboratories and uh, a lot of uh, work. I can't believe it. So uh, today, uh, are you going to talk? Which one? I mean. Ben or Marp, which, uh, David, which uh, person are yeah, you? So we're both going to present. I'm going to give um, an introduction and then I'll hand over to David and he's going to give Oh, an okay, both. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, doc Pardon me? Yes, uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, I don't know, you are waiting and really wake up or still <laughs> have uh, some uh, dreams. Maybe right now, like it's 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock? 5 a.m. 5 a.m. Thanks a lot. It's okay. <laughs> I've had a strong coffee. All right. So uh, let's uh, uh, listen to his talk. Thank you. Good. Okay. Look, thank you very much. And I assume you can hear me clearly. And if uh, otherwise, I'm waiting for Julie to send me a message. Um, it is a real privilege to speak to you uh, from Sydney. So as I said, I'm at the University of Sydney. David is now an associate professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. So he'll be speaking in about 15 minutes. And I thought I'd give a bit of an overview and set the scene. Um, professor Kimmerling asked us specifically to focus on this um, publication in Optics Letters, which appeared uh, late last year. And that's what David will focus on. But I, as I said, I'm going to set the scene with a bit of a, an introduction. Let's see if this presentation is um, Part of my group at the University of Sydney, um, we're standing in front of the Sydney Nanoscience Hub, which is a new a multidisciplinary research institute. So a mixture of uh, students and postdocs. The key people shown here are David. So um, I guess David uh, is the big smiley face there. Amol, who's in the background, and Yang, who is the student on the right-hand side. And you can see me on the left. Um, and this is, again, a part of my groups. So what are we doing? Um, I guess the cartoon explanation, which obviously resonates with the audience there, is um, a research group in the School of Physics, and we're interested in nanophotonics. And the way I explain our perspective is to take a photo of an optical table with active and passive components and say that uh, we're taking those active and passive components that are the building blocks of any optical system, whether that's LIDAR, sensing, radar, telecommunications, quantum technology, and we're putting those active and passive components onto a chip, leveraging lithography. And of course, the benefits are um, in a different contexts, uh, reduced size, weight, power consumption. So we often refer to um, swap, size, weight, power. But of course, multiple functions can be incorporated onto the chip. And we have um, the high bandwidth of photonics. And in particular, we have the low latency, which is relevant both to digital and analog communication. So that's a pretty high level. And so this particular work is part of my group's focus on microwave photonics. So this is a relatively recent focus of my program. And of course, microwave photonics deals with manipulating RF signals using photonics. It's a pretty well-established uh, research field uh, that's been going for many decades. It's fair to say that microwave photonics has um, not yet demonstrated, aside from radio over fiber and some very specific applications, it's still uh, very much um, research and uh, it sits in universities, but also it sits in defense labs, particularly in the US where there's a lot of real depth and strength. Um, you know, there are the canonical examples of radio over fiber, um, but what we're interested in in particular is exploiting microwave photonics to manipulate RF signals in particular we've focused on RF notch filters. I guess as I go forward, if there are any uh, interruptions or questions or all I can do is uh, look for the chat message from Julia that might get my attention. Otherwise, I assume everything is good on your end. 
Um, so we focused on uh, notch filters as a really key building block of any RF system. Um, and in particular, we've had a lot of uh, pull and traction um, in the sort of defense electronic warfare radar uh, context. But I think um, it's fair to say that notch filters are building blocks of any microwave uh, communication system. So if we look at a canonical notch filter, um, of course, the relevant metrics are insertion loss, bandwidth, suppression. And indeed, you can buy off the shelf notch filters that have um, pretty good performance. Typically, they have um, a performance that meets only uh, one of those um, or two of those metrics. Um, so if you were to try and buy a notch filter that could tune over tens of gigahertz and have high suppression and have bandwidth, you'd be paying a lot of money or you'd end up with something that's very bulky. Um, and it certainly wouldn't meet the requirements of many of these contemporary applications. And that's obviously where photonics can play a key role, particularly um, with um, the bandwidth. So microwave photonics provide the solution. So as we sort of dive into the specific work that we've been focusing on, it's worth saying um, that um, already we have microwave filters in our smartphones. So the surface to acoustic wave devices are pretty well established. And this links to um, one of the themes in uh, my group, which I'll be talking about. Um, the surface to acoustic wave devices are ubiquitous. They manipulate RF uh, waveforms by basically providing uh, an acoustic filter. The RF signal is converted into an acoustic wave and these work very well, but they are obviously um, low frequency and they're fixed. So they're designed to really get a very specific RF signal. So that'll become relevant as I talk about our approach. So the canonical microwave photonic link um, is shown here, it's just to anchor everyone onto the basics. Um, of course, the idea is to take that ma microwave or analog signal and to transduce it into the optical um, domain um, at 1.5 micron and to encode that analog signal onto an optical carrier that might be based on an off-the-shelf laser um, and using a modulator. Um, and once that uh, radio wave sits in the optical domain, we can process it. Uh, we can send it through a long length of fiber in the context of radio over fiber, or we can use a uh, microwave filter, microwave photonic filter, or to use a photonic filter that uh, might remove um, or channelize. And of course, that's a well-established um, principle. So you can see the filter. And of course, microwave photonic filters are um, really key components of all microwave systems. Um, microwave photonics is going to provide the tunability up to tens of gigahertz, limited only by the electro-optic modulator. So we've seen recent progress that pushes modulators well beyond 50 gigahertz out to um, close to 100 gigahertz. And we have electrical isolation and immunity to EMI. So those are attributes that are very relevant um, to um, these defense applications. Okay, so I think the key point that we have focus on this slide, the font has come out a little bit funny on your screen, is that where we have tried to focus um, in the field, and I think this is where my group over the last five years, um, with David's involvement in particular, has really established leadership, is this idea that we are combining these three attributes. So um, on the one hand, focusing on functionality, in particular, the filter functionality, and in particular, as I'll explain, using um, stimulated Boudoir scattering or other advanced um, photonic functions to provide advanced microwave photonic functionality. On chip, the integration, which we'll be talking about and obviously is relevant to AIM photonics, but at the same time, the performance. So I guess the background here is that most of the publications that appear in the literature, almost all of them, and certainly at the conferences, um, really fail to meet the performance requirements of RF systems. So they don't even bother measuring the dynamic range or the noise figure. It's just not something that's considered. And many of the demonstrations fail, fall far short of the requirements. So they're impressive academic proof of concept, but we really want to be free. And we haven't, we've achieved some really exciting um, world's first and world's best results that David will talk about in terms of performance. And I think that's really getting real traction uh, for my group with other uh, with end users, particularly in the US, in fact. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about um, 
one of the concepts that we've been looking at. So we're focused on the microwave photonic filters, and we've been very interested in using stimulated Brillouin scattering, which most of the audience there has probably heard of, but doesn't understand that terribly deeply. And I'm not going to give a tutorial on Brillouin scattering, but I'll just say that it's an interaction between light and sound. It's a well understood, it goes back almost 100 years. The basic idea is um, that light um, induces acoustic vibrations in the material. In fact, it was first studied by Professor Eric Ippen in Optical Fibres and published in the early 1970s uh, with a seminal paper in Applied Physics Letters. The punchline really is that you form a grating in the medium that moves at the speed of sound and because it's moving at the speed of sound, it backscatters um, hub light and it's Doppler shifted. It manifests in a um, amplification for the counter propagating wave and that amplification is very narrow band it manifests in a very narrow band frequency response that is dependent on the pump power so normally this is regarded as a nuisance and we put a lot of effort into suppressing this effect in fiber lasers and telecommunications but we and others have realized that the narrow band response of one scattering is an absolutely exquisite optical filter that is um in a real sweet spot for microwave applications. So on the one hand, we have the Stokes, which provides gain. It's about 11 gigahertz from the pump. And the line width is about 30 megahertz. So that's absolutely perfectly matched to many of the applications. On the other side of the pump, we have the anti-Stokes, which provides a notch filter, um, also 30 megahertz in bandwidth. And we have the ability to tailor those filter functions by tailoring the pump and this is something that we've extensively developed for different applications. Um, so really that's the key concept that underpins a lot of our work um, is this idea of stimulated by one scattering that provides this exquisite optical filter, very narrow band, tunable in shape um, with high extinction and um, this provides a unique filter functionality. In fact it provides other functionalities such as phase shifting delay lines and so forth. So we just, just absorb that plot and keep that in mind. So this is really the artist's impression of um, my group's work um, that we've been presenting for many years. And the challenge really is to take that, that concept of Brillouin-based filtering and incorporate it onto a, an integration platform um, that is hopefully CMOS compatible. And the problem is, and I haven't got time to talk about this, but this has been one of the major foci of my group, is that one is not particularly compatible with silicon, so we need a hybrid approach. Um, but we do want to build on silicon because then we can leverage all of the uh, active and passive components such as detectors and modulators and tunable components and even potentially comb sources. But I think this gets across the idea and really motivates uh, what our research has been about for the last uh, five years. So we've worked it, um, very hard on developing um, compact, high Boudouin gain integrated circuits. Um, the first publication from my group was back in 2011 and we demonstrated 15 dB of gain in a glass-based um, circuit based on arsenic trisulfide. Um, and um, that became the basis of a whole body of work. We then spent a lot of time optimizing the acoustic confinement in these waveguides and we now routinely achieve 50 dB of gain. That translates into um, deeper, stronger filters, uh, more functionality and uh, higher performance. Um, and so these chips are now optimized and that's a massive improvement. And more recently, we've been interested in a hybrid approach. So we have started to develop hybrid circuits that really combine the unique properties of this arsenic trisulfide platform with silicon. So um, I think that um, schematic em emphasizes the idea. In fact, going to the next slide, you can see uh, what we published late last year in Optica. So this is work for my group in collaboration with um, two other groups in Australia. And this is a hybrid um, silicon device through iMEC. Um, we routinely um, fabricate our silicon-based devices through IMEX. So you can see the basic layout. And the key is that there's an inverse taper that interfaces um, the jarcogenite glass waveguides, which is deposited onto the silica directly with the silicon nanowire. And that low loss transition allows us to interface with the silicon uh, circuit uh, into this high SBS region. And uh, that entire SBS circuit um, is less than a millimeter squared. 
So we have a serpentine waveguide on a, a less than a millimeter squared um, footprint. And of course that allows us to leverage all of the functionality that the silicon provides um, through CMOS. So you can see a little bit closer look um, through the microscope, um, just to get you an idea of the layout. And again, you can see the, the waveguide uh, circuit is about a millimeter squared in real estate. So very compact uh, Bruin device. So this has become a very powerful platform uh, for my group and many others around the world actually are picking up on this idea of on-chip Bruan. Um, there is in fact even a workshop dedicated to the topic that's called Wombat, Workshop on Optomechanics and Bruan Scattering. But we're focused in a number of areas on the left-hand side more in terms of microwaves, so filters and phase shifters and uh, microwave sources. So you can see David's uh, photo, happy face on the top left. On the right hand side, uh, we've got some work on um, using Budawan in telecommunications for digital communications, uh, some more fundamental work on light storage, Budawan sensing and frequency comb. So all that's published, you can go to my website and find uh, many of those publications are available. So let me just sort of speed up so we've got enough time to run through. Um, the work that really uh, set the scene for this uh, microwave notch filter uh, program and then um, translated it to a very nice collaboration with the US Army Research Lab in Maryland, in particular Dr. Wayman Zhao, who I was just emailing um, before this call, was the work that David led when he was in my group, a demonstration of a low power chip based Bruin microwave photonic filter. And without going into too much detail, um, the punchline is that we achieved this remarkable microwave filter functionality, um, tuning from uh, gigahertz up to 30 gigahertz and even beyond with a high suppression and at the same time, very low power, so low optical power in terms of pump power on a chip. And um, it's really that combined um, performance. Now, we, haven't, we hadn't achieved here the systems performance, which is what David's gonna pick up on, and that followed up. But this is where the US Army uh, Research Lab Engage does, and they supported the development of a prototype, which is shown on the bottom left. And that prototype, which is, in its current embodiment, a chip surrounded by a bunch of active and passive components because we haven't yet put the modulator and the detector and the light source and the isolator onto the chip itself. So this is still a laptop sized prototype, which was taken to Maryland early last year and tested in uh, the lab in um, Adelphi. And you can see a photo of my um, lead engineer, Eric Maggie. And I think that's a photo of um, Charles Middleton visiting the Maryland lab um, Charles is from Harris, and Harris is currently collaborating uh, with my group on a related technology. So just to wrap up my part of the presentation, then I'll hand over to David. Um, Brilliant one based on-chip microwave photonic filters that provide a whole range of different um, functionality. So we've been looking at uh, a couple of different or numerous different um, approaches, including uh, reconfigurable bandpass and multiple bandpass filters that we can shape using arbitrary waveform generation. So you can see the filter shape there that can be um, tailored and we can create multiple bands. And then we can also uh, use the uh, Brilliant One as the basis of true time delay and in particular exploiting the very strong Brilliant One gain. Um, um, we can tailor the Brilliant One uh, gain profile to achieve um, even narrower filter functions down to approximately 10 to 15 megahertz um, in principle. And uh, we also can achieve a positive link gain. And it's this work that I want to sort of use as a transition point because um, here we start to combine um, Bouillon filters with other components. And this, this work, we actually combined um, an overcoupled ring resonator and tailored SBS to achieve a lossless RF photonic notch filter. So this was really our first uh, step into um, high performance microwave photonic filter functions. And I'm going to actually hand over to David um, now to carry on the second part of the presentation. And I'll stay until this, the end if there's any Q&A. So David, I'll hand over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. I'm going to start by sharing my PowerPoint. In a presenter mode, yeah, excellent. So, uh, yeah, Ben has uh, described the the trajectory of our research on RF photonics. 
and then I'm going to pick it up from this slide and this slide is showing uh, when we started to think about these three key elements of integrated microwave photonics um, which is the functionality the integration itself but also the system performance in this particular publication we learned that uh, to create a notch filter that is optimized in three fronts let's say we have to be a bit more savvy about um, optical uh, transfer function and we think of combining um, the response of an op uh, overcoupled ring resonator with the tailored SBS gain and we will see why so if you take a look at the left side of your slide uh, the system consists of a laser hello? that is hello? intensely hello? modulated hi David uh, yes. Can you just uh, repress this? Uh, we are just you know, observing is presenter mode. Can you show us the can uh, you, presenter sorry. mode? So can you just show uh, one slide for us? Maybe just flip. What you're seeing uh -huh. is uh, maybe presenting mode, but this is a presenter mode. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Just a moment. I think... Okay, and great. And then this, is that okay? Can you see now? Yeah, excellent, thanks. Excellent, yeah. So, uh, yeah, from the left side, we see that it's a, a dual sideband modulation from an intensity modulation modulator that is fed into an uh, overcoupled ring resonator. And then we combine it with a standard SBS pump probe setup to compensate the response of the overcoupled ring resonator with the SBS gain. So now we are in slide 17 and then we can see how that actually works. The overcoupled ring resonator, as you see here, has a certain response, which is a dip. But then what is interesting is that the phase transition is actually uh, going from uh, 0 to uh, 2 pi and then there's a pi inversion phase inversion in the middle so now if you take a look at the uh, response in the middle here ideally what you want to do is to compensate the dip with a certain kind of a gain response uh, and then combine that with a, a phase response that stays zero in the middle what will that give us uh, in the optical uh, in the RF transmission transmission response? What you see is that the dip will be compensated by the SBS gain, uh, so the amplitude response will be flat. But then, since there is a phase inversion in the middle, what you see is that you create a notch filter. The key here is that only at the notch frequency here that you have no signal. And for the passband of the notch, you have strong signals because then the contribution from the upper sideband and the lower sideband will combine uh, constructively. So that is really the key of creating functionality in an int integrated device while not losing your signal in the passband because then you want to keep your signal high in the passband. So that... Um, uh, initial demonstration was actually combining SBS and ring resonators but of course the SBS was induced in a long length of optical fiber looking at these three pillars again we would like to take it further and show that we can have as much as possible integration in our system while showing the functionality and the performance so basically the whole package um, in order to do this we take a look at uh, one step back at what's going on actually in, in, in microwave photonics. In microwave photonics, if you look at the link performance, it has been well studied and the performance that has been de demonstrated is actually pretty high. So if you look at the state of the art microwave photonic link, you can get RF link gain from 0 to 20 dB, for example, very low noise figure uh, 3 to 10 dB, and high dynamic range beyond 120 dB Hertz. So these can be achieved in a single link, actually. And um, that is good enough for many RF front-end applications. But we realized once you put an optical chip inside that link, 
then everything goes out of the window because then uh, typically the RF link gain that is achieved in an integrated microelectronic system is very low because it is dominated by the insertion loss of the optical circuit so you can have a link gain of minus 30 dB or so because you are degrading your link gain automatically your noise figure, noise figure becomes elevated beyond 30 dB and this is not good enough for RF front end application where you want to have minimize the kind of loss that is prop, uh, loss and noise that is propagating across your system and yes uh, the spherous free dynamic range is also 40 dB lower than what has been achieved in a photonic link so you want to achieve photonic link level of performance by sh uh, at the same time also showing uh, integration and functionality inside the photonic chip so we came back to the idea of sculpting sidebands that we have shown in the previous uh, slides before but here instead of combining overcoupling res ring resonator and SBS we combine two rings overcoupled and undercoupled the idea is the same in a sense that uh, we put intensity modulated optical signal going to a couple of ring resonators fabricated in silicon nitride technology what does what do the rings do to the sidebands one of the ring the undercoupled ring is aligned to one of the sideband let's say the lower frequency sideband here it creates a dip but then uh, the the phase response of an undercoupling ring resonator is similar to what SBS is giving so there is no phase inversion at the center of the resonance on the other hand the overcoupled ring is aligned the central frequency is aligned to the upper sideband and that gives also a dip that you can control to be the same as the dip given by the undercoupled ring but then there is a uh, fine phase shift in the center of the resonance meaning that exactly at these deep frequencies you have equal amplitude of the side fans but opposite phase meaning that when you now combine the response from the uh, slip bands you have a rejection a high rejection on the uh, filter frequencies but then on the side uh, on, on the pass band you have again strong, strong signal because of uh, uh, adding powers between the side band so what this scheme gives is that you can use a standard intensity modulation which is compatible with link optimizations uh, you use a low loss photonic chip as your medium and then you use selective interference to create high acting extinction at the stop band and strong signal at the pass band so the the combination of these three key factors allows us to achieve a uh, high performance in our system a bit about the um, silicon nitride photonic circuit that we use this was fabricated by Lionix here in the Netherlands the wave cut loss is quite low it's uh, 0.1 to 0.2 dB per centimeter the total insertion loss from fiber to fiber is 7.5 dB because then we put interposers or uh, mode converters at the at the outputs of the chip to match the mode of an optical fiber and this is actually a much more complicated uh, uh, chip but we use only two to four rings to do these experiments so one of the key factor here in this work is the noise figure optimization as I mentioned before because this is a simple system where you can use intensity modulation instead of single sideband modulation or phase modulation for your system it's compatible with um, techniques that has been developed to optimize noise figure and one of them is low biasing it is quite well known if you have an intensity modulator a mass sender modulator and you have plenty of optical power shining to this modulator you can reduce the bias from quadrature point towards the low bias or the, uh, the low transmission point and then win in terms of gain and noise figure and this is exactly what we did so we shine one watt of uh, laser and amplified uh, optical power into the intensity modulator 
and then we dial down the bias in, uh, close to the minimum. So low biasing itself um, um, reduces the noise figure, and then we put an, a second EDFA just before the optical chip to uh, make sure that the transmission losses of the silicon nitride circuit is being offset. And this chart is showing what I just described, that when you have uh, different relative intensity noise from the uh, laser source, for example, you can play around with the bias angle and then get different kind of noise figure depending on the how much rain you're adding to the system. So this is the uh, this chart is showing the experiments that we uh, did. The results here: there are three graphs uh, depicting the link gain, the noise added by the system and the noise figure. As for the link gain, as uh, you go from right to left, the right is being quadrature and left being the uh, low bias, uh, the link gain itself is increasing because uh, um, the low biasing and the combination with the second EDFA. Of course, the noise also increases because of the second, or second EDFA, but the noise figure, which is roughly the, the, the ratio between these two quantities, uh, has a sweet spot close to the bias angle of 0.055, as indicated by the arrow here. And as you can see, then we can go below 20 dB uh, of noise figure uh, using this technique. So, noise figure and gain are two out of three uh, metrics that we want to uh, optimize and one uh, and the other is dynamic range. Dynamic range is um, just uh, a figure of showing how much range of power that you can fit into your system and that is limited by the noise and also limited in the upper part by the uh, nonlinear distortion. As you can see in the chart on the left here, uh, typically what we want to get is a high signal at the fundamental frequency f1 or f2 and minimize the third order distortion at 2f1 minus f2 and 2f2 minus f1. The chart on the right here showed the uh, uh, measured spherically dynamic range at the frequency of 12 gigahertz. You see that we have a fundamental signal and the third order intermodulation and the spherically dynamic uh, measure, measured here is around 116 dB uh, hertz, which if you again compare to what has been shown in different uh, integrated microphotonic devices, this is something like more than 30, 35 dB higher. So finally, what we want to uh, show is the how the gain, noise figure, and dynamic range evolves with the modulation frequencies. This is showing the RF gain, and you sh uh, we see that the RF gain constantly goes above zero from, let's say, zero to 12 gigahertz. Uh, the noise figure itself uh, stays uh, between, let's say, 20 to 16 dB, and the dynamic range itself is stable around 100 14 to 116 dB uh, uh, across the whole frequency band. So this is a stable performance across the whole band of frequency. Let's not forget that this is a microphotonic filter. So all these uh, system level performance is achieved simultaneously with exquisite uh, filtering performance. Here on the left, we showed that we can uh, tune the bandwidth of our filter uh, between 150 megahertz to 300 megahertz, we can also tune the central frequency of our filter half of the free spectral range of the uh, ring resonator, which is from, uh, let's say, 0 to 12 gigahertz. And then, of, of course, as you add more rings, you can make a multiband filter also using this approach, showing that both uh, bands, top bands, achieve high extinction. And finally, to, to signify the performance of the filter, we did RF experiments, meaning that we really put uh, two signals into the uh, RF photonic filter. 
one contains the signal which is uh, on the uh, frequency of around 9.45 gigahertz here which is much uh, weaker compared to an interference it's 30 db weaker than the interference here at 9.7 gigahertz so with an input spectrum like this you see that uh, the rf photonic filter actually amplifies the wanted signal by 2 db as shown here and completely eradicate the unwanted interference this is showing that the filter uh, preserve the quality of the signal at the pass band and completely remove unwanted signal at the stop band so if we want to put on a table now and comparing the performance that we have achieved uh, with uh, our uh, filter here you see that uh, the, the, the link gain the noise figure and dynamic range now is very close to the performance of a link only without any functionality here on the red at the top so uh, compared to other approaches for example with integrated devices um, our link in is much stronger the noise figure is much lower and the high dynamic range is also much uh, higher so we believe that this where the 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 whole field has to evolve where people think about these three pillars integration functionality but also system level performance only by then uh, the RF photonics technology can be actually used to pair RF technologies in various applications. So with this, I would like to summarize our talk. Um, we demonstrated the first integrated microwave photonic filter that simultaneously achieved performance, integration, and functionality. We show record low noise figure, high dynamic range, and amplification in the pass band while having ultra high rejection at the stop band. Um, and we believe that this is the first entry point in a paradigm shift uh, towards applicable RF on-chip RF photonic uh, technologies. And as Ben also already showed that uh, it is interesting to combine not only ring resonators, but also on-chip stimulated deon scat scattering to have uh, higher level performance, you know, uh, in such a filter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Since uh, we have uh, maybe one or two you know, questions, however, uh, you may have a lot of questions. So uh, later, probably we will give you their contact, you know, like email and uh, something like this. But for now, can you just have uh, one question or two? Sure. You're okay? Uh, we're happy to take okay, questions, okay. yes. Uh, David, I saw that you used uh, both uh, uh, chalcogenide glass uh, platform as well as silicon nitride. Uh, can you comment on the difference between the two and also mention what the optical power was in the waveguides? Um, yeah, so it's interesting. Um, chalcogenide glass itself is very uh, specific for... Uh, stimulated Briwang scattering. It has the right uh, geometry and it has the right material properties to be able to confine both light and sound such that you have uh, a strong SBS interaction. At this moment, that cannot be achieved yet in silicon nitride. So um, the, the, the way of thinking probably is to use silicon nitride as a large scale integrated circuit and probably activate some of the parts of the silicon nitride or a silicon um, uh, photonic circuit with uh, chalcogenide to have the SBS functionality only specifically at that waveguide. So that is the answer of the first question. The second question is that um, the, the optical power in the waveguide itself, I have to guess, let's say, if I have uh, 30 dBm of input optical power and around 6 dB of uh, loss in the electro-optic modulator that will give around 
200, 300 milliwatt of power inside the silicon nitride waveguide. That is my uh, my guess. Let's say. And, and, well, thank you. And uh, and for both of you, it's a beautiful example of uh, photonic circuit design with built-in compensation elements rather than making perfect rings and perfect coupling and so forth. So uh, it's a beautiful example. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions? Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, let's thank you know, these uh, two speakers, clapping.